just recorded a fabulous podcast on Richard Wanthan with our amazing summit. Please watch this because I think you'll find it quite interesting. Namaste, welcome to another episode of the Vichar Mantan podcast. I am your host Sumit Sharma and it's my great honor to be hosting this project. A project looking to explore dharma, make it more digestible and see if we can rediscover some of the ancient classical ideals such as sustainability, liberty and flourishing. Very honored today to introduce to you Dr. Shamenda Darwar. Namaste, welcome to the podcast. Namaste Sumit. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, for those that don't know, um, Dr. Shamenda Ji is a social psychologist and he's the co-founder of an organization called TUF, which is the Unity of Faiths Foundation. Um, so Shmanaji, we know each other from a very long time ago. It's uh, my great fortune to, it's quite full circle actually, to bring you back here and, and ask you questions. But for those that don't know, give us a quick lowdown of, of where your story began and time before TUF. Um, oh, born here in UK, my father's from India, my mother's from Kenya. Dad came to Liverpool when from India. Um, my childhood had been spent here and, and in Liverpool, and um, yeah, we were uh, in, obviously my, my father being the first generation to come over here, or an immigrant that came over to the country. I was the first generation to be born here in the seventies. It was a different way of looking at life. Mm. Um, everything. I think there was unity at that time. Uh, my dad was a dad was sorry is. Um, was a Sai Baba devotee. Sai Baba was all about unity of faiths. Mm. Uh, there's only one religion, religion of love. And growing up, seeing my father going into different places of worship and holding his little finger as a kid, as a child, my sister and I, when we used to walk into a mosque or a gurdwara or a temple or a church or a synagogue, every time we will question my father and say, where are we going? He said, we're going to the house of God. Mm. So by soaking that in, by understanding that wherever we went, doesn't matter what place of worship we went to, it was the place of God, mm. it was the home of God. Mm. So we never saw any different between anybody from any race or any color or any religion. Mm. Mm. And you mentioned actually that back in the 70s growing up, people were more united. Do you think that's not the case at the moment? I think that there's a, there's a division. I think, um, and I was going to come to that point, when we started this organization called the Unity of Fates Foundation uh, in 2011 with my co-founder, uh, Anne Bornholt, and Claire Bornholt, we found that there was a lot of unity amongst religions and different cultures. Mm. And it was a good idea to doing at the time. What we've realized now in 2024 that the organization that we set up, and it's a bridge, right? It's, it's a bridge between religions or religious organization, non-religious, governments, city councils, virtually everybody, we're the bridge. In 2024, this organization has now become a necessity. Okay. Um, reason being, there's division in, in amongst people from different cultures and different religions. You know, you have division within Islam, you have division within Sikhism, you have division within Sanatana Dharam as well at the same time. Everybody has a different mindset. Everyone's got a different way of thinking that, you know, my, my cult or my sect is much more powerful or has more meaning than your does. You know, for example, we have the Shia Sunni scenario. For example, we have, for the Sanatana, we have uh, Swami Narayan, you have Hare Krishna. You know, you have different, different sects. So people have this different mindset. There's, no mu there's not much of unity amongst everybody and it, I think post-Covid a lot of youth and I say this a lot of youth have moved away from the religious aspect of their DNA sure. and gone towards spiritualism okay. and that's really fascinating. That's quite interesting actually and, and let's discuss that in a bit more detail but more, more about yourself actually I was just doing some research on the, on the train on the way here you know <laughs> so you, you were British Indian of the Year uh, award winner 
you're included in the top 100 Indians of the decade. Yeah. Um, you've spoken to people like uh, Barack Obama. You've been gone and seen Pope Francis, um, uh, Mayor of London, you've, you, the Queen Elizabeth, great public figures, global leaders from around the world. That's all via the Unity of Face Foundation, the work that you're doing there. What, gr growing up in uh, Liverpool, spending time in Southall, did you ever think you'd meet people like this? Was it on the cards? Is it a... How's that come about? Um, I think, look, you know, growing up in London and growing up in Southall, uh, amongst all places, um, you always, I think, look upon your father as a, mm. a, as a beacon of light or a role model. Mm. And like I mentioned earlier, when I saw my father, you know, bringing people together at that time in the 70s, it inspired myself and for my, my co-founder to maybe take the unity of faith's message, mm. but take it in a more global stage. Um, and believe me, you know, you, the names you've just given us now, the President Barack Obama's or the, you know, um, His, His Holiness Pope Francis, this all came about organically because mm. we're just trying to do, trying to be a bridge amongst everybody, you know, mm. trying to be um, that subtle and, and honest, and I think, and I think neutral bridge for everyone to come upon and, and meet each other. Was there, a, was there a particular inspiration that st helped you start off the foundation? My was father. My, my father is a, a big inspiration. Sati Sai Baba has been a, a great way of, of I say, a, again, a beacon of light for me to have that message of there's only one religion, the religion of love. And obviously John Lennon. Okay. You know? Uh, the Beatles have been uh, an inspiring figures for, for many millions of people around mm. the world. I think mm. John Lennon was very inspiring. So, I mean, uh, the foundation didn't happen overnight. Was there a, a, a moment where it was solidified? Was there a particular meeting with people where you thought, this is what we're going to do now? I, I think we came up with the idea in 2011, the, the passing away of Sai Baba. And um, there was a message that had to be... Um, uh, I think shown to the people, put to the people that you know. I think this is the way that the message of there's only one religion, religion of love. There's only one caste, the caste of humanity. If we can bring it out to a global stage, if we can bring many people from different walks of life, and then sort of breathe it, understand it, investigate it, take their account of what what, what does that actually mean mm. for, for other people. And I think that that's 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 how we came forward mm. more than anything else. And and so. Uh, we'll, we'll put details of Unity of Faith Foundation into the show notes so our viewers and listeners can, can read more about it. But what does TUF do? What's the, what's the purpose? Well, TUF, oh, like you said, stands for the Unity of Faith Foundation. Uh, we're a secular charity. We're now working in four continents around the world. Um, we go in similar to what, you know, if you have a, a situation, if a city council has got a problem or a government has a situation, we get recommended uh, by people like from the United Nations or from UNESCO or from other, other countries or the foreign ministry. We go in like the A-team. You know, you, you've got a situation where you have radicalization. So we go, we form a program or anti-radicalization. We've got a climate change project called Kind Climate. We go in and see how we can work with your city council, lift the community above the poverty line, how to bring education to human values, so whatever the, the need is or required of that country or that city council, mm. we go in, we work with the city council or we work with the government, and then what we do is we bring businesses and we bring charities on the same table. So everybody takes ownership of the project. Mm. We're there, the project could take two years or three years or four years. And then after completing the project, we hand it over to the city council or to the businesses or to the charities. So they take ownership of it and then it becomes their project. And all we do is then we supervise from, from, from afar or from in, the, in the background, we take a back seat and let them flourish with it. And that's why this project and that's why this, this organization has been incredibly successful is because we work behind the scenes and make sure that everything works like clockwork. Mm. It's got quite good onus as well. So not, you're not, they're not reliant on you. You are empowering them to carry Absolutely. on the project, make it theirs and, and run forward with it. So some examples of that then maybe. So I know you, you worked with some of the firefighters after the Grenfell Tower incident. 
to support them through mental health and the trauma. Tell us, tell us a bit about that. Um, I, I think it's it's well documented that uh, our, our our base was in in Kensington at the time, and um, a lot of the children around the area we would work with because we had football project education human values football projects that were, sure. and it you know it was just. I think one of my 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 my, um, my co-founder Anna is the one who called me up from Australia. Do you know what's happening? Mm. I said, "What's going on?" She woke me up about one o'clock in the morning, and then I get SMSs from because we had a WhatsApp group with all the children, and some of the children would contact and say, "Doc, can you come over here?" So I drove down there, um, and what I saw was a towering inferno, mm. um, and I tried to counsel as many people that were coming down. One incident I had, which was really, you know, for me, it's, I will, it will stay in my, in, my, in my soul about where a firefighter, because you've got to understand, it's not just the, the survivors that have been scarred. Mm. The firemen were also scarred. Mm. And this one incident where a firefighter had to choose between a mother and a child and a five-year-old to bring them down. Mm. Now, that is, you know, I, you, we want to... We, we don't want to be in that situation course, at all. Yeah. But that is what, and still the, some of the firefighters which uh, I spoke to, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still dealing with, I help them out, obviously, volunteeringly. But that's what they've gone through. Mm. And that's, what the, that's, what, that's why this situation hasn't been completely solved, is it? Mm. We're going for. So, yeah, that's, that's... There's a lot to do. And I remember actually during the pandemic, there was a Kind 20 campaign as well. Um, I, I changed my profile picture. I saw had, had the banner and everything in well, there as well. well. See, what happened was, Nobody thought we'll be locked down, let's be for, honest, for yeah? long, everybody was locked down. Now, our trustees of Tough, they're leaders globally of many religions. Uh, so obviously we have the vice president of the Jewish Council International, Sikh Council president, you understand? We have represented from Mecca, represented from the Shaolin Temple in China. And then when we're having this um, Zoom call about we should do something as an organization, and this is the word they used. They said, you know what? Uh, God's gone on holiday, mm -hmm. right? And all, every door is shut. We can't even open our places of worship. So he's gone on holiday. We need to do something. So we saw that there was a lot of kindness happening at that time around the world. Mm -hmm. So we thought 2020, kindness, okay, let's, let's all turn COVID-19 into hashtag kind20. Kind yeah. So our job was to highlight as much as... Uh, uh, as kindness as possible. If any uh, anything was taking place in Australia or Mexico, share it on the platform so people can get inspired and they can have it. They can swap. You know, people in Mexico can do get inspired by people from Australia and vice versa. And that's how. And we hit about eight, I think about eight point four million hashtags. Oh, okay. I was just about to ask, how do you measure the success of a campaign? Yeah, like it, was, that? it was hashtags. It was eight point four million hashtags. I mean, they're in the Modi Prime Minister they're in the Modi. Hashtag that helped as well. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. so big, big press there, of course. And I think so similarly, like I, I mentioned Obama already, but you took a, a football team to the White House? Look, we took a football team to the Vatican first. Right, okay. Right, so that came about because he was recommended, uh, Pope Francis was recommended by Obama to meet us. Right. All right. To meet he this. was recommended yeah. to meet you, yeah. not the other way around. He, he, he recommended His Holiness Pope Francis that he should meet this tough, wow. the tough organisation. Just before we get into the story, how does that happen? Why would someone recommend... Okay, so we don't know how... Uh, when we first started this organisation, we started doing festivals. Okay. In 2011, we had a first festival called the Unity of Faiths Foundation. All right. And we called all the religious and they said, we are one. And it was a big success. We had 8,000 people. And then what was crucial about that festival, um, and it's going back now to understand, we're going, you know, everyone, we're going to we're going reverse now. Yeah. Um, so Ealing Council, because we did it in Southall Park, we did the festival in June 2011. And in August 2011, there were, there were riots all over London. Yeah, there were, yeah. And a lot of areas, even, you know, flamboyant areas in London as well, like Westminster, Kensington, everywhere, got destroyed. Except for Southall. Okay. <laughs> now, now, this is really, really crucial because it's really important. Now, Ealing Council said, 
there were Muslims, Sikhs and Hindus and Christians all outside all the places of worship pre- protecting mm. south of from the, the Iron Bridge all the way up to the H- Hambra Tavern. It was, it was absolutely, uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a force, there was a shield of all religions. And when we got contacted, and then I remember that the, the next day it was David Cameron, the Prime Minister, who came on question time and said that um, I'd like to really uh, commend the people of Ealing Southall and especially this festival called the Unity of Faiths Festival wow. that brought people together. We get a phone call from Ealing Council on the Friday saying, guys, what you did that day, do it again. Because wow. we weren't expecting to do, because uh, I'm a, like I said, I'm a social psychologist and as an art dealer, we've, we just brought people together thinking it'd be a great idea of the unity of faiths, that message of there's only one religion, religion of love. So we went ahead and did the second festival. Again, we're not organizing, we, we want to win a charity at the time. We did the unity of faiths festival again in Southall. We had 26,000 people. Mm. Um, and that's when we got contacted by the White House that we have seen this important festival that you're bringing together and President Obama will be in touch. And that's how the opening wow. happened. That's how it started. And then the, the, the doors opened to, yeah. to various other places. Um, and then in Liverpool as well, your hometown, you, you've been helping with mental health there. Yeah, I mean, look, my father came from India to, to Liverpool and um, I, I, we, we also want to give back to Liverpool. Liverpool's, again, a wonderful city for football. As you know, it's in, it has this incredible football team. And also music, you know, come on, you know, the music in, in Liverpool is huge. The Beatles, I mean, I'm inspired, but I've always been inspired by John Lennon. It's been mm. a crucial part. And it's just basically giving back to the city that I love so much. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going through all the things that I've sort of picked up in my research. And then there was a Memphis music festival as well. But there's probably lots of other Well, it's connected. Projects. You see what it is. We, did the, we have a, a project called The Road to Memphis. Last year it was called The Road to Nashville. Okay. And the previous year was called The Road to Liverpool, which is the Liverpool International Song Contest. It started in 2020 on John Lennon's 80th birthday because Liverpool City Council said, we can't celebrate our son's birthday, which is John Lennon. And can you come up with a project? So we, again, like you said, like the A-team, we go in as yeah. an organisation. We came up with a project that's similar because the X Factor, everything had closed down. So we said, let's do a song contest. But this song contest is unique. Why? Because what we'll do is when people submit their songs, musicians and songwriters, they'll have an opportunity to speak to a life coach or, or a psychologist free of charge for three free sessions. Okay. Three free sessions. Now, that was great because we, we know the creative arts suffered so much. And, you know, there's been, there were so many, many suicides mm. that were happening because they couldn't get gigs, they couldn't get jobs, and there was no money for these. So we gave them counselling support. And because of that, the whole project became so international where first year 4,000, then Nashville contacts, Nashville being the music city of the world, contacts Liverpool City Council said, we want this project, can you contact the tough team? We went to Nashville, called it the road to Nashville, then there became 20,000 songs and 4,000 people asking for um, submission. And then we went to Memphis, now another music place wow. everywhere Elvis is from. Wow. And, and so the, the premise of tough is about bringing faith together. How does something... Faith and religious and non-religious. Okay. Remember, we're a secular charity. Sure, sure. So our job is to be on the table, on a neutral platform, to have every walk of life to discuss their community, not religion. And are, are, there, are there communities that are not at the table? Are you working to still... Because there's, there's all types no, of I mean, look, people our, out there, right? our, our, our trustees... We have a healthy, healthy about of trustees from virtually all religions. Let's go, As, into, let's go into the details. So what, who, who, what kind of trustees do you have? So we have people like Edwin Shuker, who's the vice president of the Jewish Council. We have um, uh, uh, Gurmel Singh Mali, who has just retired. He was the president of, of the Singh Sabha, which is the largest Gurdwara in, in, in England and UK. And also he was the international representative of Harmandir Sabha, which is Golden Temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Peter Bennett, who is the secretary of the board of Islamic Center Regions Park, which is also the, if you look at it, it's the international center for Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Then we have uh, Darren Brown, who works for the Foreign Office, but at the same time, you know, we, we, he's also a representative where we look upon how we can bring the LGBT on board, for example. So that brings a different factor as well. And, you know, if we go along, then we've got Freydon Freydonson, who's the 
uh, chief advisor for the president of Iceland, for example. I mean, I can go on if you sure, understand. Sure, sure. But they're like solid people. And these are people representing all different types of faiths, faiths communities, religions, communities, governments. And, and their understanding, I guess, the, the mission or the, the vision of TUF is to, to bring them together. And bring people together, be the bridge. I think what, what we are, we're, we're the, why the organization's unique is because we don't take like ownership. We don't say, oh, you know, it's our organization. No, we want to empower you. We want to empower your charity. We want to empower your business and be the bridge so we can help you develop, we can help empower you so you can basically be empowering right. others. So uh, uh, uplifting of society and, and you know, that's, that's a great sort of moral stance and, and vision and what have you. So what, what does a cohesive society look like? I don't say Southall. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, I don't see a cohesive society, I'll be honest with you. Okay. There's disruptions everywhere. Sure. Right? Let's just be honest about this. I think you're only going to find a very cohesive society is maybe in an ashram or something. You know, I'm going to be very honest with you because there is a situation everywhere. And up, up post-COVID, there's a lot of anger out there, all right? A lot of anger. There's, and you can't really blame anybody. Who mm. do you blame? Because jobs, are the, you know, job, it's not it's the government exactly or government, society or state people or in bankruptcy. Mm. There's, there's many factors. I don't, I'm not here to put a blame game sure. on anybody. Sure. But there's many factors. And everybody's intelligent on your listening or watching this that understand there's many factors to this mm. but how do you bring about calm in a situation like this sure. what you can do is you know do something um, that will put ease to your mind for example I always look at firstly is clarity of thoughts mm. which is really important then purity of heart then the sincerity of actions and then one can have a, you know, you can be, you can be spiritually, you know, conscious mm. with all these elements around you. If that, if you put that into practice, then that will really help you in life. And I think also since post COVID as well, people from different backgrounds, different kind of way of working, and doesn't matter who you are, what you are, you have a situation where you get mentally troubled. Sure. Or you have pressure on. I mean, you. mental health is a big problem at the moment. Absolutely, one but, in two. I don't know what the stats are, but yeah, absolutely. So, and I, I think it's important that you know every morning when you wake up, for thirty seconds, train your mind. Okay. Thirty seconds, right now. I'm going to give you an example, Sami. When you wake up in the morning, do you brush your teeth? Yes. When you wake up in the morning with a bad mood, do you? Brush your teeth. I think I always brush my teeth. <laughs> I'm Why? Sure, I do. Why? A habit, I guess. Habit. Habit, yeah? yeah? Good mood, bad mood, you're still going to brush your teeth. Sure, yeah. All right. If I say to you, you don't need to brush your teeth, you can go to the dentist every six months. Is that right or wrong? And you're not going to brush your teeth. You're just going to go to no, the dentist. No, my dentist is exactly. going to Exactly. Sure. But it's, what's the word that I would say that you brush your teeth every day? Consistency. Am I correct? True. Keeps your teeth healthy? Yeah. Agreed? Yeah. All right. Some people want to get fit or some people want to get trained, want to get healthy again. They go to the gym. When they go to the gym, they say, I'm going to slog it out for two hours. I come back, go and look at myself in the mirror. Nothing's happened. Yeah, it's two no hours. Change. First, two, of course, nothing's happened. You just went there. But if you go consistently yeah. for six months, which I saw you train as well. <laughs> on COVID if, times. if my trainer or my dentist is listening, <laughs> I, I'm consistent with it. Yeah. If you go for six months, would you see a change in the mirror? I think so. Absolutely. Why? Consistently, yeah? Okay, yeah? So what I say to people, why don't you brush your mind? Okay. Why don't you pull weights with your mind? Now, how you do this? When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is, is think of something, a happy thought, piece of music, or a happy memory you have. Could be someone, of, your dad, your mom, your sister, your, your children, or anybody, mm. your girlfriend, your wife, could be any, anybody. Think of a happy memory. Hold it for 30 seconds. Okay. Just hold it for 30 seconds, right? Then, do, then get up and do your day. What will happen is you're training your mind consistently mm. to have a happy thought as you get up mm. suddenly now i don't know when right maybe two three months down the line you will see how negativity bounces off you i can imagine because yeah. suddenly you've trained your mind in such a way that consistently every morning you're thinking of what yeah good things happy things positive, positive and words. you know it, it's the way of how we i wouldn't manipulate the mind yeah. but how we saw like set the mind mm. and I think that's the best way to, that, that's how I look upon it and that's what's helped a lot of people post-COVID 
30 seconds trick. That's good, good, good. I mean, everyone at home, try it. Please let try me, it. Let me know how Please it works try it. for you. I, I agree, absolutely. You know, power of the mind, intention, positivity. And, and 30 seconds, not much. It's true, it's true, absolutely. Even, even consistently. Like, I, in fact, in my life, I have some non-negotiables. I will always play football you know, once a week. I'll go to the gym once a week. <laughs> <laughs> Things come up, it changes. But I think you're, you're right, consistency is, is extremely important. And gaining mental clarity, being more calm, at peace with the world, what's going on. But these sound like great things. It's utopia, it's utopic. People have got big problems. There's, we discussed, mental health problems. There's financial difficulties. You know, are we in recession? Are we not? Elections are booming. So all the, the, the parties are, you know, shoving stuff down your throat. Like, it's hard work out there for a lot of people. I don't think, generally, people are equipped to deal with these things. They suffer as, as a result. So, and so maybe going back to some of the stuff that Tuff does with mental health or... Um, we were talking about a cohesive society. What is it about bringing different faiths and communities together that helps them achieve serenity, that helps them achieve a calm project or whatever it might be? Well, like, are, are they bringing values with them? Well, are they, look, is it just I, I, I representative? Think, I think when you bring people from all walks of life or many walks of life on a table, mm. you don't discuss their religion. Okay. You don't discuss their culture, okay? But you discuss what the, what's, what's, what's the DNA in all of us. Okay. We have a soul, all right? We have a heart, mm. we have a brain. Mm. If we can discuss what relates to all of us, that if I cut my skin, I cut your skin, it's the same colour that comes out. Mm. So suddenly we don't need to discuss. That goes away, the whole religious aspect, the cultural aspect. Let's discuss what's on the table now. If you live in the same community, you're from a different religion, different culture, I have to, I'm living in the same community as you. Let's find a way that we can make our community much more calmer and help elevate the future generation. I agree with you. I do agree. But, and, and, but what we've noticed is when you don't discuss religion, when you don't discuss religion, many things happen in a pleasant and forwarding way. But if, when you start going into detail, mm. that's why we're the bridge. That's why Tough has been a bridge and doesn't discuss religion. Call the Unity of Faith Foundation by having faith in each other as human beings. Okay. And that's, that's worked so far. Is that yeah. not, I guess, you're not brushing things aside? Because there, there are religious, there, there are people from religion, maybe extremism, that hate other religions. It's been, it's been the course yeah, of division that's, that's, across the world, they, across they, countries. They won't come to the table, Sumi. Okay, so they're not, they're sure. They're, they're not, not going to come table. on the table. They, they'll be, they, there's a minute, and let's be honest, it's like, you know, I can be very honest, like you have so much fundamental Islamists, you have fundamental Khalistanis as well, at the same time you have fundamental Hindus as well. You know, you have fundamentals, you have the right-wing Brits as well, you understand that? There's fundamentals in every area, every culture. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to come to the table because they've had, they have an agenda. Yeah. But majority, and I can say this, majority of people from every culture and every religion, every colour, wants to be in harmony. Mm -hmm. Wants to be. And this is a big thing. Because the minute make a lot of noise, and, yeah. right? They've got a mouthpiece. Mm. So they're loud. So you're thinking, oh my God, yeah. there's a lot of them. No, there isn't. Mm. The majority actually want harmony. Mm. I think that makes sense. And, and it's important, but they don't know how. Mm. Okay. Because, they, because they get drowned in from this loud kind of, uh, from, their, from their, the, 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 the minute part of their religion or their culture mm. is making a loud noise. But when you're bringing them to the table, say, listen, we're all part of the same conversation here, mm. and we all want the same thing, they come forward. And we've seen that in many, not just this country, remember this, we're working in many countries, we're working in four continents around the world, and this discussion comes up, this situation comes up, and, but when you know you have, a, you have a formula that works, and that's the reason that this has been successful, we have a formula that works, you go with it. But obviously, what works in London doesn't work in New York, what works in New York doesn't sure. work in Sydney, so or Delhi, or anywhere. So it, it gets bespoke, made for that. Sure, that makes that makes sense. And actually, I think I think I, I think I'm pretty sure I learned this at Balvikas. Is Vasudeva Kutumbakam? You know, and for everybody world. who doesn't know Balvikas, yeah. Balvikas was a 
a how would you describe Bible class? Uh, the Sunday school. A, a Sunday school where we teach education, human values. It was uh, the founder of this was Sati Sai Baba, uh, where obviously the message was always, you know, uh, there's only religion, religion of love. But yeah. so we... <laughs> I, 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 you know, growing up, my mum would take us to South Hall. There was a there was a Bible class in Slough, but I didn't want to go there. I want to come to South Hall. <laughs> you know, cause I knew the people and, and everything, and and it was great. We learned. Values, we yeah. learn, you know, how to be good humans, that kind of thing. And I think, you know, irrespective of, of religion. Um, and I'm not being a skeptic, but it's my job to, 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 to probe and to, to pry. But of course, there's division in society. And, and a lot of that, I think, is bent on religion. And it's, it's very devi divisive. People, I think people are searching for identity all the time. And through identity politics, different groups will pull on people and make that society a bit divisive. But the, the point of this is, I think, at Bhavikas, I learned about Vasudeva Kudumbukam, mm -hmm. which is uh, the whole world is one family, so Sanskrit phase. Also, Ikam Sattvipra Bahuda Vedanti, um, which is that the truth is one, wise men call it by different names. But those two are Sanskrit. They come from India, from Bharat, from Sanatan Dharma, which is arguably and is the oldest living civilization on the planet. Do you think that Either, either tough or generally people around the world can heed advice from the most ancient religion on the planet? Of course, why not? Because remember, it's a way of life. Mm. It's not really, remember, Hinduism doesn't have a founder. Mm. And again, I'm saying the Hinduism, it's, it's, sorry, it's incorrect because Hinduism came from, 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 from Greece or from the Iranians who used to call it Sindhu, for example. And the mispronunciation of the Greeks called it, instead of Sindhu, they called it Hindu because of the Indus Valley. Yeah. So, yeah, it's Sanatana Dharm. You know, what is Sanatana Dharm? As you know, you, you, you say it correctly. And I love the way that you, how you describe Sanatana sure, Dharm. Sure. But again, it's a way of life. And what it has, it has an ancient understanding. For me, Sanatana Dharm is education and human values. Okay. That's what it is. Education and human values is a very nice, posh kind of mm -hmm. look at forward way, looking at of the word Sanatana Dharma, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. that is it. The Gita, what is the Gita? It's the manual how to live on the planet, or how to live around the world. Yeah, and, and to, to carry out your duty. No, great, great, great stuff here. So what I'm going to do now is go into something called the rapid fire round. Quick, quick, sharp questions just to uh -huh. get to know you a little bit better. Um, could you describe for me a paradigm shift in your life? A moment where everything changed? Two. Okay. Um, one, when my father passed away, because um, he's my best friend, and I learned everything from him. Second time was when I collapsed in Iceland, doing a conference, okay. um, and they found a tumour on the Monday. They did a CT scan, and I was paralysed from my left side, and um, on the th because of the British ambassador who came to see me in hospital, um, was didn't know what to do, how he's going to send me back. So he demanded a MR, MRI to be taken back with me to England. They did the MRI on the Thursday, and on the Friday, the MRI showed no tumour. And that changed my life because it made myself made me think that I want to give back 100% to this planet and cherish every moment as much as possible. So that those are two right. life yeah. uh, changing I was, moments. I was reading one of the articles saying it was a golf size, yes, golf ball size tumor and, See, and it, it disappeared. Went, disappeared in five days. And they've got this in the Icelandic in the Reykjavik city uh, city hospital. They've got it, and it says in Icelandic, it says it unexplainable. But I don't know how to. It's a very long word, right? But it says it unexplainable, and they've got the CT and they've got the MRI scan on the on the on the frame. What do you think that was? For me, it's obviously the universe. I, I said to Sai Baba, because I'm a believer, Sai Baba, I said, listen, I've got a lot to do here. Mm. I don't want to go. Or I'm not going to stay like this, like a vegetable. So make me better. Send me back. I've got so much to do, and I'm praying to the universe and everything. And again, it, it just changes your life. Isn't mm. it? And that's why my, my life is all about helping as many people on this planet. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, what's the best piece of advice someone's ever given you? I think the best piece of advice is what my father has given me. Just listen to others, 
be kind to yourself mm. so then you can be kind to others. Listen to them, be kind to yourself. And there's no point in being kind to, if you're not kind to yourself, you can't be kind to others. Mm. And that's really important. Mm. So you be the best version of yourself first and that's going to be kind to yourself. Mm. Look after yourself. Yeah. I say that often, that the best thing I can do for you is be a better me. Yeah, of course. Um, There's no then, point having a sick me or sick you, is there? Yeah, it's true, it's true. If you could interview one historical figure, who would that be? Oh, there's many actually. Uh, pick one. Um, I would choose Lord Krishna. Okay. Yeah. Greatest psychologist, greatest musician greatest politician, greatest uh, strategist. Um, I think he had everything. Mm. Actually, that's everything. A, that's a good answer. I've not had that one before. You tell me, great, greatest musician, we know that. Yeah. Everyone yeah. is to be divinely in tune with his flute. Yeah. Strategist, the Mahabharata war. Mm. Greatest warrior as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. Greatest politician, how he played that how he, yeah, that's, that's just super interesting. Do you have a favourite book? Um, I do. And again, you know, it's one of the things that makes me happy. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it puts a smile on my face. Okay, yeah, I mean, sure. And, and for me, it's always been, uh, my favourite character has always been Willy Wonka. Okay. Can you create magic? Can you bring magic to others? Can you deliver chocolate and put a smile on every child's face? So that's, but that's for me. It's fine, that's, no, that's good. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Ooh. I've been trying this, reading people's minds. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Because um, I know you, you're, you're into Jyotish and, and things like that. So is I, it along I, those lines? I, yeah. I, I, I mean... What am I thinking now? <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm just putting me on the spot. Sure. But yeah, I mean, look, I, it's, it helps to be in tuned, sure. um, to have intuition as well at the same time. I think it's helped. Hmm. I think since 2020, uh, it was 2019 since I had my episode, I think I'm much more aligned with the universe than ever before. Sure. Though I, I, I had this spiritual mind, but I think now it's just completely... But spirituality but being practical at the same time, and that's really important. I, and what now is, for me, is, is, yes, you know, if we think from here, and that's from your head, it's logical. Mm. If we think from here, mm. it's emotional. But I think from here. Okay. It's okay. called the gut reaction. Sure. So your gut never gets, your uh, gut will always yeah. tell you. Second brain. Your gut will always, it's not, it shouldn't be, it's not your second brain, it's, it's your first, first brain. brain. Okay. Yeah. So when they say, I had this gut reaction, you never go wrong. Yeah, you can feel it, can't you? That is, that is your, that's your soul, that's why. That's your soul there. Mm -hmm. So your soul's never going to tell you wrong. Mm. We'll never say, never put you in the wrong path. That's why I, I listen. Even right? if you don't understand it at the time, you know, it might be a greater message. Hold on. You. Pause. You don't need to make haste decisions. Sure. Emotionally or logically. Mm. Just wait. It'll happen. That's good. Good. I like it. Uh, who have you met that's inspired you the most? I think you've, you've had a few, you've told us about your father quite a lot, but is there, is there someone else? Yeah, I mean, my co-founder, Anna, being an incredible role model for me. Um, I think my mother has been very strong looking after my father as well. My mother's been strong. Um, and I, I, I thought, which I found very humbling, is when I met... Um, his holiness Pope Francis. Mm. Um, he hugged every single. We had Muslim children, Jewish children, we had different different types of children. Took the football there, and he was so humble. All he said to us was, he gave everyone a hug. He said, "You know what? Just pray for me." Okay. He, I said, "No, you pray for us." He said, "I pray for you. You pray for me too." Okay. And seeing that that down to earth of this mm. man, and we know where he lives. He doesn't live in the Vatican. He lives in this small little place. Um, Behind the Vatican, very humble, very humble guy. Mm. So yeah, mm. Pope Francis. What what do what does your family and, and your children think about the work you're doing with Tough and, and? I think my children were eleven and twelve when I started Tough, mm. 
and but they can see the impact it's made. My daughter and my son were involved in the in the organisation as well, but they saw the impact it made and say children maybe their their age group as well. Mm. Um, you know, saving children from radicalisation, saving children who are going under the poverty line, for example. But not just in this country, but many other countries around the world. And when children see other children develop, for example, it's just heartwarming. I mean, my daughter now is at the moment. She's in Kenya with my nieces and my sister doing a project in Kenya, helping children or women or girls in, a, in, a, in, a, in an orphanage where girls have been brought there because they're obviously got no parents or they've had a sort of situation where they've had a problem and they're just empowering these girls now. And wow. in Kenya right now, I think about 3,000 girls or something. Wow. Wow. Super interesting. So you were also inducted into the Royal Society of Arts. You know, that, that, that makes you a fellow alongside people like Charles Dickens, Nelson Mandela, Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough. You know, and, and I guess for those that don't know, fellowship is a recognition of outstanding work to make the world a better place and, and kinder place. How does that make you feel? Yeah. I just got on with it. Sure. Just carry on with the so I just, I, I, Look, it's nice to be recognised. Sure. And th those names you're given just now, obviously, they're people that done really well in life, mm. you know. I mean, done really well. I mean, I would say they've done well for society and sure. help others. And I think if the RSA made me a fellow just only because sure. they must have seen... And you can use that to amplify your work and, and yeah, absolutely. carry, carry the message. Uh, absolutely. I, I think, I mean, it's not just being a fellow. I just as being one should just be a nice fellow mm. in the world. Happy deal. fellow. Yeah. Happy, happy fellow. Um, I'm aware of this, but let's m maybe help, help our guests understand a little bit further. So tough, great work. You've been doing stuff all over the world. We've, we've spoken about various initiatives and, you know, your calling, your passions. And I, we can clearly see that here today. But what's the next step? What, where is, is tough going next? Um, so we've just uh, signed an MOU, which you're part of. Uh, a new project's called Tough Borough. Uh, we were going to start in India before COVID. We had set up everything but because of COVID we couldn't set up. Mm. So now we're uh, lining up with an organization called the Indian Minorities Foundation and we will do projects with them, with the Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi, who is now in his historic third term after his uh, winning of the elections. And we'll see how we can sort of develop and add value to the table. I think more than anything else we'll be adding value mm. to the work they're already doing, the Indian Minorities Foundation. and the secularism of, of, of Bharat itself, you know. I think it's really important that, that we come in and bring a different way of looking at things, but not changing much, mm. but adding value. Sure. And so secularism, a lot of people will, will disagree with that or perhaps not want that. Why is something like that important for, for Bharat, for India? But you look at the makeup of India. Mm. Have a look at the makeup of India. I think India has, if not the largest population of Islam, for example, Muslims mm -hmm. in the country. Many Sikhs, for example. I mean, Sikhs' home is India. Mm -hmm. The home of Sikhs is India. Mm -hmm. Home of Jains is India, mm -hmm. for example. Um, so I think it's important. But again, you know, see, you see, this is this is where a lot of people, I won't say get it wrong, but get mis misguided, right? They, people call it the home of Hindus. Well, it's not the home of Hindus. Hindus doesn't have a founder. Mm. There's no such word as Hindu. Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana is a way of life. It's there for everyone to see. Mm. If Sanatana Dharma is getting projected to different parts of different cultures, it's not. I'm not putting religion in your face. Mm. I'm just showing you basically a way of life, for example, how to be a better person. And I think that you will see that in the next four years now. You will see a, a, a different type of how Bharat leads the world. I really see that now. Mm. And it will lead a lot of, not just, like I said, Sanatana Dharma, but it will lead an education of human values mm. in a very, um, uh, I would say, uh, positive way, but practical at the same time. You will see that. A lot of people will see that going forward. And I think it's, it's the way of not putting religion in your face or down your throat. It's how you can digest what you're giving. In fact, it's food what you're giving to somebody. Mm. 
if you keep if you give something someone doesn't want to like, they're not going to they reject it immediately, and that's mm. really important. Mm. Be subtle about it. And what we've been doing for the last twelve years, our experience of how to deal with sensitivity amongst different cultures mm. and bring them forward. Mm. It's quite it's quite admirable, but also I think quite challenging. And could you tell us about a challenge you've faced in in putting the Unity of Faith Foundation into a project or into a council or something? Has there been... Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I, my background, like I said, I'm from I'm Sanatani, or Hindu as people call it, and it's from a Catholic background. When we were uh, putting together the, the anti-radicalization program with British values, we had to do it through football. And majority of our children, 70%, were from, from, were, were from a Muslim background. So what's a Hindu and a Christian leading 70% of children? Yeah, but thousands of kids. Mm. But the, the parents, the imams, the mosques would invite us like we're, it's like we're their family. Mm. It was challenging at the beginning because obviously being from my background, who I am, because they asked Dr. Talwar, you're not Dr. Khan or you're not Dr. Mm. <laughs> Ashid or something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and Anna's born out. She's not, you know, she hasn't got, but it, it, we... The way we look at things, the way we, we projected ourselves in a very fair and, like I said, neutral way, that's how other people came forward. Mm -hmm. And that's why we know that it, the formula does work. Doesn't matter what background you're from, mm -hmm. if you have good intentions, and this is really important to me, sure. if you have the right intentions in life, you cannot go wrong. Mm -hmm. You actually cannot go wrong. And that's really important for everybody to understand. Have the good intentions. It might take a little time. But you will get there. I, I, I've seen the work that's been done, and I'm sure our viewers and listeners will, will click in and have a look in more detail. But there's lots of interfaith out there. Yeah. I don't think they're all successful. Yeah, Where? because, again, you just, you just gave the answer just then. There's loads of what? Interfaith. Okay. It's not interfaith? Well, we are unity of faith, unity which is the secular. And... and we don't discuss religion. Sure. We're here to... Listen, we're here... We call the unity of faith to have faith in each other, mm. and that's really important. Mm. Hence, by, by staying away from religion and culture and discussing your community situation as a fellow neighbor or a fellow friend mm. has more power of getting the work done than discussing, oh, you're a Muslim, okay, I'm a Hindu, oh, you're a Sikh, you're a Christian, you're a Jew, okay, fine. No, that doesn't get anywhere. Mm. You can have a samosa and have a cup of tea and then discuss your thing. That's, and that's what people have been doing sure. with interfaith for a long time. Yeah, and that's yeah, why yeah. it doesn't work. Okay. I, I was going to say, I've, the point I was making, that, yeah, there's lots of interfaith groups. I don't think they're very successful. You know, you see stuff on TV all the time. And it, they are truly representing their religion. And that's the foremost important thing. But I think you're saying something opposite here, where we're bringing people together... And religion is not the most important conversation. No, you call the imam, you call the gyani, you call the pundit, you call the priest, all right? you call the rabbi on the table, and we discuss community. Mm. We discuss what's the issue, what do we need here? Do we need a football pitch? Or do we need, okay, no, let's, let, let's start this. Okay, do you know what? The kids need this in the area. Not discussing, oh, Jewish kids need this, Hindu kids need this, Sikh kids, no, no. What do the kids need? Mm. And sure. that's really important. Sure. No, great stuff, and uh, I've certainly learned a lot about the Unity of Faith Foundation and, and spending time with yourself as well. So, so thank you for that, and uh, thank you for joining us on on this podcast here today. Namaste. Namaste. Are there Namaste any everybody. are there any pearls of wisdom, leaving thoughts, something you'd like to leave our listeners, our viewers? Well, I think the two things is the thirty second trick, sure, which is really important. Mm -hmm. Manipulate thirty seconds every morning. Happy thought, consistently, it will be a shield of positivity that will make sure that negativity bounces off you mm. and doesn't, doesn't affect you. And I think, you know, if we practice that, that's really, really important. And I just want to end with this, this is really important for everybody. It's an affirmation that um, since tw 2020 I've used, and um, I say this, so I, I say this every morning. So I say, thank you for sending me good people, good thoughts, good news, and good things. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, and every single day, and each and every second. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Brilliant. All right, on that note, thank you very much for joining us on podcast. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. And to all our followers listeners at home, you know where to get us, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, YouTube, Amazon Music, and your favorite streaming platform. This was the Unity of Faith Foundation with Dr. Shaminda Tawar. My name is Sumit Sharma, and this was the Vichar Mantan Podcast. Namaste. Mm-hmm. Thank you.